My name is Jane Borowski, host of Invisible Tears. This podcast will be about my story and my words, talking about my own personal experiences and self-healing. I do not claim to be a therapist, counselor, or licensed psychologist. Hello, my name is Amanda Bedard, and I'm the co-host, producer, and editor of Invisible Tears. I'm a Reiki master, certified professional life coach, spiritual coach, wellness coach, and a counseling practitioner. Some of the content you will hear in this podcast may be disturbing to some. Viewer discretion is advised, but it is our hope by putting this information out there that we may help others to heal. We will always be a platform for truth and healing. This is Invisible Tears. Welcome to Invisible Tears. I'm Jane, host of Invisible Tears. I'm here with my co-host, Amanda, and we have a special guest today. We have Jen Amell. She is the director and producer of development with Crawl Space Media, and she's also the producer and the host of Dark Valley, a new podcast coming out. And she's also an amazing investigative journalist. And we're so happy to have her with us. Hi, Jen. How's it going? Hi, Jane. Thank you for that. That was very, very kind. I'm so happy to be here. We're happy that you're here. <laughs> yeah, we're so happy you're on. I mean, our listeners have literally heard about you so much anyway. So it's really nice that we're like, wait a minute, Dark Valley is launching like so soon here. Why hasn't Jen been on? So thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. It's my pleasure. I'm so happy to be on here. You guys have an amazing show on Invisible Tears. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm a weekly listener. Good to know. Yeah. As Jen's a subscriber. Yes. I am. <laughs> So as Jane mentioned, um, producing and hosting our new show from Crawl Space Media and Glassbox Media, it's called Dark Valley, and it's really an investigative series about the Connecticut River Valley cases, of which Jane is the only survivor, which I'm sure your audience knows all about. And I guess all three of us, it feels like the gang is back together. All three of us were, you know, instrumental in, in making this happen. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. But Amanda, you you did the not so glamorous but so important task of logging tape. Yes. That's like industry speak for like we recorded a lot, a lot of audio when we were out in the field up in New Hampshire and Vermont. And Amanda, you listened to all of that. I did. <laughs> it's quite a feat. It was like hours and hours and hours. Yeah. I mean, it was like three solid days of just all of us being mic'd up the entire time. So thank you for being patient with how many months it took me to go through and log that. But also it was pretty interesting to go back through and listen to all of us too and like remember our experiences as well. But so we understand what pieces of audio and what pieces of clips that we have for the project. I can't tell you how helpful that was in the post-production process. Like, I mean, obviously we've got to tell a story and it's got to be chronological in some way and you don't want to use all you know 40 hours of audio or anything so it was really helpful to go into your logging documents i think there was so many times we just forgot that we were mic'd up i know i know i did but I'm glad we were because there are so many moments that you can't really plan for and remember to hit record and set up all the microphones and stuff. So I'm glad we just had it rolling for most of the time that we were all together. Caught a lot of cool things. I agree. I think some of the most authentic audio sometimes comes after you've been mic'd up for a while and you just forget that the mic is there. So I think a lot of those authentic moments were captured too. Yeah, for sure. When we took the trip up there, I, I didn't know what to expect. It was the first time that I've actually gone up there to visit a lot of those places. It was impactful. It really was. I know I had a lot of stuff that was going through my mind that I just didn't expect. I felt so connected with so many things up there, but yet so emotional about so many things up there because it's been so long since, you know, I've really dove into, you know, the Connecticut River Valley cases and really talked about the victims and it was emotional. It was, it was so much. Yeah, understandably. I'm curious, guys, do you have a particular memory that stands out to both of you during production? I have a couple. I have one when we believe that we were at the site where Eva Morse and Elizabeth Critchley's body was found. It all of a sudden hit me that that could have been my dumping ground and uh, that 
was uh, very overwhelming to me. I didn't expect to feel like that. And probably the other moment was when we went to Bernice Cordemash's grave and uh, saw no stone. All we saw was the marker. Yeah, that was, I mean, I think we were all pretty affected by that, that it was, you know, kind of this placeholder plastic marker for Bernice. Do you want to talk about like what your side mission is with the gravesite? Yeah, Bernice, I mean, she was only 17. She was murdered in a small community. And it just amazes me that over all these years, nobody got together. The community didn't get together to collect money for a stone for her. So um, me and Jen are Invisible Tears, along with Jen and Crawl Space Media are going to raise some money and we're going to get her a stone that she so deserves. Yeah, it's so symbolic of respect, I think, to just, you know, make make her remembrance, you know, a little brighter. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I don't want her to be forgotten. And, you know, let's not forget she was murdered. (laughs) It's not like she died of natural causes or suicide or anything like that. This girl was murdered at a very young age in a very small community. I don't understand why the community never got together to, you know, help the family with buying a stone. Yeah. And I want to be clear that we're not throwing shade on the Cordemash family at all. No, not at all. Through learning more about Bernice's life and her family and stuff. I mean, they were didn't have much means. Like they lived in a trailer outside of town, which was very rural back in um, the 80s. So yeah, maybe it was just like they didn't have the means to buy a stone because they're expensive. But back then, I mean, we're talking 30 years ago. Yeah, they're expensive. But I mean, I'm not putting it on the family. I think the community could have gotten together and said, oh my gosh, you know, this family's going through so much. Their daughter was murdered. As a community, we should be getting together and um, helping this family in some way. And her murder was well documented and in the news quite a bit because she first went missing and then they found her body. I just feel like somebody in the community could have done something. Well, perhaps if we give them a nudge, they will. Now we can develop a community that can come together. And now that it's known and out there, we can build that community to help put something there. Yeah, absolutely. I did learn through Eva Morse's brother, Frank, uh, apparently they were hit with like a really unexpected cost after Eva's remains were recovered. New Hampshire didn't have a medical examiner at the time, so they had to ship Eva's remains off to Maine for pathology to be done. And guess who incurred the costs of that shipment? You have to be kidding me. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding. It was crazy. So like, I mean, Eva Morse's family was not of means either. So they like had, you know, a pretty steep bill to pay after that. I wonder if something like that had happened with the Kordamashas too. Possibly. Maybe. I mean, that kind of speaks to how important it is that that fund was created, the Victim Relief Fund. Have you talked about this at all on Invisible Tears? We have. Good. We talked about the financial impact on a victim or a victim's family when tragedy hits like this. And we talked about the Victim Compensation Fund and how much it helps families and how much it has, you know, helped thousands of families and victims with, you know, medical bills and going to court and getting a lawyer and advocates and all that stuff. So, yeah, we've talked about it. Yep, We had an episode on it. Yep, an episode in season one. I'm sure you highlighted Jane's role in all of this, right? Oh, of course. Jen, I have to be honest with you. And and sorry, Jane, we're going to talk about you right in front of you. But Jane is super famous for not really understanding the like her impact in situations. I'm sure you you know what I'm talking about. When she first told me that she was actually one of the people that helped, you know, establish this victim compensation fund in New Hampshire, it was so nonchalant. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on here. And so she started detailing out and told me the entire story. I was like, yeah, no, this is an episode we're talking about this because it didn't exist before you, Jane. And it didn't benefit you, but it benefited everyone after you. Another one of those amazing things that Jane did and she never really gives herself credit for the amazing things she does. So. I know, Jane, you've talked about it like a sub chapter in your life story, which <laughs> <laughs> I just like anyone else would be like, yeah, and I did this and I did this. I think I was more angry that it didn't exist at that time. Right. That's fair. You know, 
people just don't realize the financial impact that tragedy like this has on families and victims. They, people don't realize it. I never realized it until it happened to me. It was a huge financial impact on me. But people are getting help now, and that's what's important. That's true. Yeah, and just to button up that point, I mean, this fund was created far after the Connecticut River Valley murders, needless to say. Uh, Families like the Cordomashes and the Morses couldn't benefit from it at the time. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And now back to our episode. So Jen, what drew you to Jane and Jane's case in sort of looking into the Connecticut River Valley cases. What initially drew you to it? Well, I have to give that credit to my boss, Lance Reinsterna, over at Crawl Space Media. He's the one who brought these stories to my attention. He was like, have you ever heard of these serial killings up in New England? And I was like, what? No. Like, with how hungry our media is for stories of serial killers, I just couldn't imagine that no one had really dived deep enough into these cases in like present day, like in the last 20, 30 years. Right. So I think for me, like with my producer brain on, I was like, oh my God, what an untapped like epic of a story. And then I found out that there was a survivor of this serial killer. I was like, oh my, like I have to talk to her. Like, (laughs) that's amazing. I think it's the same emotion that most people go through when they hear a story like this. Like what an amazing story, what an amazing feat of survival and strength and stuff. And like they put Jane on this pedestal of like superheroes or something. You just want to like kind of be in that light for a moment. And I think when I first reached out to you, Jane, I was like, there's no way, there's no way she's going to like talk to me even. She's not even going to reply. Well, it was funny because the timing was so perfect. Yeah. I was like, just going to say We that. had just started creating Invisible Tears and then you guys come into light. It was just, the timing was just crazy. Yeah. Really, Sarah serendipitous, I'd say. And I hope, like I've said this before on the missing and crawl space airwaves, but Jane, it seems like you had to, like you did the work, like you did the work to get to a place where you were able to talk about your own story, like dive into the stories of these other women. Like you had to do all that emotional work before any of us even got on the picture. So I just want to give you a shout out for that. Because it's like, yeah, we came to the story or, or, you know, you and Amanda became friends through your husband been drew right amanda yep and like hearing your story again just like gives you that glimmer like of hope <laughs> like in resilience and life and stuff but you're the one who, who had to do the actual work so thank you oh thank you yeah i did a lot of work on myself over the years and i think that's when i realized you know what if i can do this i wanted to help others and that really was the whole concept of starting invisible tears to tell my story and help others and i say something of the same thing in episode one of Dark Valley that I approached these stories as any journalist would, any podcaster would. It's like, it's interesting. I want to know who did it. I want to get justice for these horrific things that occurred. I want people to know what happened. And then it really wasn't until first speaking with Jane that I was like, oh, this is such a bigger story than who did it. I mean, it's truly a meditation on trauma and grief and how an individual heals, how a community heals or perhaps how they don't heal. So I think those themes are at play and Jane's mission became my own mission into highlighting these women's lives and remembering them. That was another thing, amazing thing that I think that you're doing with Dark Valley is you're giving these victims a voice through their families now. Um, A lot of their families have never come forward and really talked and nobody really knew who these women were. Through Dark Valley, you're giving giving them a a voice and saying, hey, you know, I wasn't all about this murder. I I had a life before. And that was one of the reasons why I agreed to be a part of this project with you, because that's the direction I was hoping that it would go in. That part of it, I think, is amazing. Oh, thank you, Jane. Yeah, it seems like the stars aligned in that front too. It's like what our actual focus was and what our responsibility is to these women and to your story, Jane. 
And I also warned you too, once you started diving into this, you told me, I want to find answers. And what did I tell you? Jen, you may find more questions than answers. Boy, did I. Jeez, that's totally true. But on the note of this kind of being like a resurrection story, in a certain sense, trying to, uh, you know, tell about these women's lives rather than their deaths, per se. A lot of the people that I spoke to, family, friends, ex-partners, had never been contacted by anyone. They'd never been interviewed by law enforcement. They had never been interviewed for a newspaper, for, you know, the book that's out there. They've never gotten the opportunity to tell their story and to communicate that this was like probably the most painful thing that ever happened to them, you know? So I think there's real power in that and just giving someone who has never had a platform a platform to speak, right? Exactly. That's really eye-opening. It's so many people. I mean, not, not even by law enforcement? Yeah, a lot of them now. I mean, you guys had uh, Julie Murray on your airwaves recently, uh, who is incredible. Oh, she is amazing. But I couldn't believe when she told me that she hadn't been interviewed by law enforcement about her, you know, missing sister Maura Murray until about three years ago. And it's been 19 years. So 16 years had passed before the cops ever talked to her, which is like, if you're looking at a case like Maura's or any of these cases through the like a purely investigative lens. Like, where's the crime scene? Where's the abduction site? Uh, you know, uh, where's the body? What are the mechanics of the murder? Not to say that more is, is a murder per se, but you're going to miss out on so much context in that person's life. And so I think what I've tried to do with Dark Valley is kind of approach the like perpetrator victim thing inversely. So instead of asking a bajillion questions about who could have done this. I'm asking questions about the people who were affected by it, right? And trying to approach it from the other way around. And I honestly think that like information has shaken loose because of that approach. Definitely has. I thought I knew everything about these cases. You brought to light a lot of stuff I didn't know. Have you been able to interview any of the law enforcement? How cooperative have they been? Oh, you're putting me on the spot here. Oh, I am. (laughs) (laughs) I will diplomatically say the New Hampshire and Vermont State Police are aware of the project. I have not spoken to any person on the record. I think we recently made a little tiny inroad with the detective that you had spoken to, Jane. Detective McLaughlin. He seems like a good guy, honestly, and like genuinely interested in your case. If he's listening, please reach back out to Jane. You guys need to have a conversation. And it's totally understandable if based off of what he's dealing with now to sort of speaking directly to the officer, because I think he does listen. It's understandable if what he's dealing with now, because there are active things going on, totally understand the need for, you know, not going on the record and not really divulging too much, but the simple lines of communication, at least between him and Jane, um, with us completely understanding too, we would never divulge anything that would hurt anything that they were working on. Jane just wants to be in communication and wants to like proactively work with anybody who is working on her case. That is all. Right. And feel like someone cares after all these years. Exactly. This detective has professed to care and that's wonderful if true, but it needs to be backed up by some action. But yeah, I mean, it's historically difficult for the media and law enforcement to kind of coexist. So, I mean, I don't know what I expected at the start of this. Before I even reached out to you, Jane, we had um, a contact with the Vermont State Police that we emailed and kind of presented, you know, our ideas and, you know, this is what we're planning to do and stuff. And he at first seemed pretty open to not sharing case information or whatever, but guiding us on what information is accurate and perhaps what not to release. That can get sticky from like a journalistic perspective. Obviously, we would never want to harm any kind of investigation or like prosecution process at all. But the media is there to keep government in check. While we want to be responsible with information and stuff, it's like, I mean, the media can't be gagged by law enforcement either. So it's a delicate balance, I think. Agreed. I mean, over the years, I've seen 
on 2020 or Dateline. And when law enforcement does use media and investigative journalists to get information out there, it helps to solve cases. I mean, it's proven that it's helped to solve cases in the past. So why not use them? I don't understand it sometimes. It's a really excellent point. I mean, podcasting in particular, because it is so democratized and kind of easy to turn around to. It's not like a docuseries where you have to spend, you know, four years in production. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a medium that can be used as an investigatory tool because people react in real time and they send you comments, feedback, information, tips. Like if I had one message, it would kind of, you know, piggyback on what you said, Jane, like it can be a tool. I know the party line for the state police is to not say anything to any sort of media entity, but perhaps reevaluate that stance if you can. <laughs> I know it probably gets passed down from the AG or the attorney general, as you guys have talked about, I'm sure the attorney general general handles all major crimes um, and homicides in the state. The investigation, I mean, is headed by the attorney general. And like any attorney is going to be like, just don't say anything <laughs> right? ever. I can't even go in there and have a conversation with him. It's the case is active in and I have nothing to say to you. It's like, I'm a victim. Come on now. You don't want to have a conversation with me. The AG in New Hampshire is very frustrating to me. Yeah, it's kind of an old school of thinking. Old school mentality. Yeah. I mean, it's possible to change. It's possible to make different moves, you know? We're going to try to get that change. And we're going to try to help them to see new ways and uh, see change. I also want to highlight, Jane and I made dozens and dozens of phone calls. And in one of my correspondences with the former Associate Attorney General, Jeff Strelzen, I had asked him pretty basic questions, like what the designation of each case. Is it open? Is it active? Is it whatever? For all of the new Hampshire cases. And then I also listed Jane's name. And his reply to that was, uh, that's not our case. That's not under our purview. And I was like, what? <laughs> Since when? <laughs> what changed? And he had no comment after that. Oh, actually, no, he did give me a little bit of feedback on asking like why the attorney general didn't oversee your case anymore, Jane. He was like, maybe Jane's case is with the municipal police department where the crime occurred, which would be Swansea, or it's with the district attorney for Cheshire County and so <laughs> got on the horn to Swansea PD and they're like oh no <laughs> like absolutely not that was not our case the state police was on it from the beginning and then the district attorney was like oh no of course not we don't have that case that was high profile at the time so whereas the attorney general wouldn't necessarily have direct oversight of an attempted murder per code because it was high profile and the conversation around it was that Jane's attack was connected to those uh, earlier murders or whatever that the AG had swept in and taken Jane's case. So that's what the district attorney had told me. Both these organizations expressed that they remembered Jane's case, asked how she was, and hoped that, you know, some movement would happen sometime soon. So that was kind of nice. And then, so we didn't get a whole lot of clarity until you got that call from Detective McLaughlin, Jane. So I recently tried to clarify with him who the lead is on your case. And he's like, while I have been following up on leads in Jane's case and working it and have interest in solving it, I am not the lead on the case. He's like, that would be under the attorney general. <laughs> Which we were already told that the attorney general doesn't have my case. Right. I'm not even sure if the cold case unit has your case. But the attorney general oversees the cold case unit. Yep. And major crimes, too. So I don't know what's going on. This has been my struggle for over 10 years now. Can't believe it. They claim it's an active case. Okay, if it's active, who's running the case? I just can't get a straight answer. Strelzen says, no, it's not AG. Then McLaughlin says in an email, it is the AG in the cold case unit. So who knows? Yeah, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and just think that like he doesn't really know or not that he doesn't know, but didn't like take the time to look it up and whatever documentation exists for it. And that's fine. Maybe just assumed because it was high profile or something. Well, that's what we all assumed. Exactly. But it's like for anything to happen in Jane's case, they need to establish chain of command. Oh, exactly. And 
you, you, Jane, need to know who you're sending people to who have information or tips. Yeah, because that's the most frustrating part of it is these people go to the cold case unit or they go to Concord to try to, you know, share the information they have for a suspect they think that may be involved and they get nowhere and then they come knocking on my door. So who do I send them to? You know? Yeah. You know, that was pretty much my question. I don't know. They contradict themselves. We're going to get answers to this. Yeah. And I don't mean to hint that like anything nefarious is happening or any kind of conspiracy whatsoever. I think in any kind of bureaucracy, things get confusing and there's many different channels and avenues and information gets mixed up. Things are mislabeled. I don't know. It could be any number of like stupid bureaucratic things that we don't have an actual answer on this. But I sure hope that they can tell you sometime soon. I'm hoping. I'm definitely not going to let it go. I mean, um, I deserve some kind of honest answer and, you know, just tell me what's going on. Tell me who I can talk to on a regular basis. I mean, I don't even have an advocate. I've never been given a, a victim's advocate. All I'm asking for is some honesty and reassurance that my case hasn't been forgotten. Somebody tried to kill me and my daughter. This person is still walking the street. My case has still not been solved along with the rest of the cases. I want some assurance that these cases are being worked, not forgotten. Jane, thank you for bringing that back home. It's so important to remember at the end of the day, you were almost killed. Someone tried to kill you. Someone tried to kill your daughter. Someone did kill at least eight other women before you. And that's what we're talking about here. That's the gravity of what we're talking about here. It's not like you had your lawnmower stolen or anything. It's like, this is as grave as it gets. Yes. And if somebody's not going to work it, give the information to somebody that, like, share the information then. Like, give us the information. Absolutely. Yeah, I know, um, Jane, you and I have been talking kind of off air about this new law, this new piece of legislation federally, which, you know, unfortunately doesn't help you or your case because you're a survivor, thankfully, but it is the Homicide Victims Families Rights Act, I think. Every opportunity I have to like say this in a public forum, I want to say it because it kind of flew under the radar. But this piece of legislation gives families of homicide victims the right to petition the court to get the case files and the investigation out of the hands of whatever law enforcement agency has it. There's a couple stipulations. Uh, It has to have gone cold for at least three years, and it has to have had the inclusion of some kind of federal agency in the investigation. So the FBI had to like take a look at it in some official capacity. If it's gone cold after those two things, then you have the right to petition the court to get those investigation files and give them to a third party who might have more time more resources to look into it. A third party could be everything from a journalist, an investigative journalist, uh, or a news outlet, like the Times or the Post or, you know, whatever. Or it could be a private investigation agency. I think you have to qualify in some respect to be designated the investigator. But um, I think that's like the most important change in victims' rights in terms of like crimes and homicide that's happened in the last, you know, 50 years. So I just want everybody to know about that. I know I've told the families of the other victims in the Connecticut River Valley case that this exists, that this is an avenue if they choose to pursue it. And obviously it's a huge decision because it's court battles and probably finances and you got to hire an attorney or whatever, but at least there's some kind of recourse now. Yeah, that is huge. Yeah, it is. I wish there was something for you, Jane. As weird as it sounds, yeah, I would love to know who did this to me and my daughter. I would love to know who the Connecticut River Valley killer is. I would love to see justice, not for only myself, but for all the victims. But for some reason, I've come to the point and maybe I just have accepted the fact that my case is not going to be solved. But it doesn't mean I don't want it to still be investigated. But I think I have pretty much accepted the fact that, you no, know, will I ever see justice? Probably not. Maybe in another world, this evil monster will burn in hell. That'll probably be the only justice that I'll ever see and my daughter will ever see. But I, I'm so okay with that now for whatever reason. I think it's because I've just been through so much and so many years have gone by and, and I'm more accepting of it. If I focus on that, it kind of takes away my focus from Um, healing and helping others to find some healing in whatever trauma that they've been through. Yeah, 
of course. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Jane, but when I hear that, I hear I need to protect myself. Yeah. I need to protect my hope. This is deeply emotional. As you said, I'll say it again. Someone tried to kill you and your daughter. I can't imagine what it's been like to go so long without any answers and not even knowing if someone cares and if they're investigating it. So it's like, yeah, you had to do that for your own emotional well-being. Stop expecting something to happen. But that doesn't excuse a lack of investigation. I totally agree. And that is one of the things that um, we've been focusing on and we're going to be focusing on, not just for myself, but for other families too with other cases. Trishane's case is a perfect example. And same with Julie with Maura Maura's case. I mean, I'm still going to advocate as much as I can for as many people as I can to, for them to find answers and seek answers and make sure, you know, law enforcement needs to do their jobs. If we stay silent, they're going to just proceed to do what they've been doing. We just need to make sure that our voices are heard. Well said, Jane. So do you have any little, and I mean little, like little, little teasers for us about what you're going to do? What's in episodes one and two? I'm dying to listen to episodes one and two. I am too. Yeah, I just want to say that you guys have not heard episodes one and two, nope. which are both premiering on June 16th. And the rest of the episodes will be weekly after that. Oh boy, teasers. Just a little bit. A little bit. I don't want you to give too much away, Jen. So episode one is kind of situating us in the place. Uh, It's talking about the Connecticut River Valley. We meet Jane, get a little sense of the relationship that's building between Jane and I as we're like setting out on our mission. Uh, There's definitely uh, really funny moments. (laughs) that I like to include and stuff. And then episode two kind of dives in with the first case with Betsy Critchley. Awesome. Can't wait to hear them. And yeah, given that we haven't listened to any of the episodes, so I think this would be a good time to announce too that for everybody listening, we are going to start doing reaction episodes to the episodes that drop. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have our normal drop of our Invisible Tears on Tuesdays still. And then on Wednesday, it's going to be Jane and I recording a reaction to the episode that dropped the Friday before of Dark Valley. I think it's an awesome idea. I love it. I mean, I'm sure that I will hear some of the things in Amanda too, where we could talk a little bit about the behind the scenes, little things that had happened. And we spent three days together. It was like from sunrise to sunset. It was pretty amazing. I think it was almost therapeutic, Jen. You think so? Oh, absolutely. Can you say more about that? Because I mean, one of the things I really wanted to do was visit all their graves to show my respect and let them know that they're not forgotten. And uh, I will never forget them. I mean, these are women I've never met before, didn't know anything about them except the horrific way that they were murdered and left this world. But they were so much a part of my life. The one thing I wanted to do that you were able to give me was we visited a few of the graves that we could. We have more. And uh, before I die, I hope to visit all of them. But that was really therapeutic for me. And being able to do that with you guys, I mean, I couldn't pick two other people that could have been there with me and supported me. It was really emotional for me. I can't help but think, you know, there could be a grave for me somewhere where where a survivor is coming and visiting me. Could have been me. I can't imagine what a journey it's been for you, Jane. And I've tried for the better part of two years to understand at least a, a piece of what you've been through. But I can tell you that it was no small emotional feat for myself. And I'm sure, Amanda, not for you either, to be there with you and to like hold that grief. Right. You have captured all this in such a perfect way. I mean, you have been so compassionate with everyone about everything. I can't count how many times through that three or four day journey we had up north where you were like, are you okay, Jane? And that meant so much to me. That's when I really knew that, okay, this is the perfect person to be on this journey with, to tell this story with. And um, I have no regrets. I know it's affected you too emotionally. And that's 
the way I wanted the story to be handled. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much. I mean, how can you not be affected by these stories? I think the show lives up to what you just said. It's a stories told with compassion. And every moment I thought about how this might affect the family if they hear it. I thought about how it would affect you, Jane, if you hear it. Uh, I thought about how it would, the ripple effects through law enforcement. There's a lot of consideration, I guess, is what I can say in each minute of audio that made the show. Um, So I I appreciate that. And gosh, what an honor to be part of this with you. Thank you. I can't wait. Oh my gosh, we've been given dates for so long. I cannot wait. June 16th. It's a Friday. June 16th is a Friday. It's going to be on Fridays. Yes. And again, the first two episodes are dropping on the 16th and then it will be every Friday an episode will drop. We're going to have like a brief kind of interlude of a week and then drop the second half of the show. But what you can do is sign up to our Apple subscription service and hear the first seven episodes of the show right on that premiere date, June 16th. So if you can't wait, you want to binge, sign up for that Apple subscription. And then I have one other kind of housekeeping thing to announce, which I sprang on you this morning, Jane. So I'm sorry about that. But we are organizing a virtual live event um, with myself, with Jane, with Crawl Space Media guys, Tim Plary and Lance Reinsterna. And uh, that is going to be on June 22nd and please follow crawl space podcast on instagram twitter for more details about that awesome that's gonna be fun yeah it will thank you so much jen really looking forward to this it's been quite a journey for you doing this project thank you jane it was my absolute pleasure and i kind of can't believe that we're here go on over to dark valley wherever you get your podcasts subscribe rate review help us out tell your friends Uh, We got to get these stories out there. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Invisible Tears. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast to hear all future episodes. Click into our link tree too in the episode description to find and follow us on all our social medias. And it also links to our website, invisible-tears.com, where you can keep current on any events that may be coming up, read more about Jane and the team, and read more about all the Connecticut River Valley unsolved cases. If you want to learn more about my wellness practice, Guided Path Wellness, head to guidedpathwellness.org. There you can read more about me and my certifications, more about the Reiki and coaching services I offer both in person and remote, and read all about my products for sale that I make through the practice. Feel free to utilize the contact us section on the website with any questions or utilize that free 15 minute consultation booking button if you have any questions about what might work for you. Evil may exist in this world, but we will not let it win. See you next episode.